I'm Dr. Aaron Donaldson. It is 6 p.m. December 5th, and this is the Civic Union, a collaboration between Access Humboldt and the Department of Communication Studies at Cal Poly Humboldt, uniting the people of Humboldt County with their representative government. We want to hear from you. You can drop us an email to thecivicunion at gmail.com. That's all one word, thecivicunion at gmail.com. Tonight we are officially on Twitter. You can tweet to us at the Civic Union. All one word, at the Civic Union. Today, I'm going to be talking to the mayor-elect for the city of Eureka, Kim Bergell. We're talking about her making the shift from the Ward 5 seat to the mayor's office. We're going to get some background from the mayor-elect to contextualize her time in public service. And we're going to look at the issues facing the city of Eureka, California. A press release from Kim Bergell shared on Redhead, Redheaded Black Belt says that in her almost eight years on the Eureka City Council, Kim has worked diligently to improve the health, safety, and quality of life for her constituents. She worked for the Transportation Safety Commission to get Eureka declared a bike-friendly community, supported community projects like the Redwood Skywalk at the Zoo, which terrifies me, and passionately <laughs> endorsed the return of the Tualat Island to the Weehat tribe. She has worked with the police and mental health professionals to better serve the community, is dedicated to creating a fair tax system for cannabis farmers and businesses, and she continues to show up and voice support for nurses and medical professionals fighting to achieve safer staffing levels and more reasonable working conditions in our hospitals and care homes. Mayor-elect Bergel, thank you so much for joining us here on the Civic Union and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's just really exciting to talk to you. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. The first segment, we just really basically want to talk about um, the move that you're making from like the Ward 5 seat on the city the, uh, city council to the mayor's office. But if I'm not mistaken, you also represented Ward 3. You were elected in 2014 to do that. Is that correct? I did. I represented Ward 3 my first term, Ward 5 my second term, and that was due to Measure P, uh, which was a measure that was passed to um, have uh, voting done per ward instead of uh, across the city. Okay, so the first question I'm going to ask is kind of two prongs, and it is just where was your office geographically, if there was such a thing, uh, mm -hmm. when you were representing those wards? Was there a building that you went to, or where did you work when you did that work? So I've always done my work out in the community. There really wasn't a building to go to. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been to a lot of different meetings with people, but my, my favorite thing is to meet people where they're at. So I show up at a lot of events uh, and have the opportunity to talk, talk with people that way, as well as, you know, having coffee, uh, you know, that type of situation. But yeah, um, now I'll have an office at City Hall, uh, which will be different, uh, but I still plan to meet people where they're at. Have you visited also. that office in City Hall yet? Like, do you know where it is in the building and, and what it's even like? Like, pick a picture of it for our audience, if you would. So currently, it's lovely. It's a lovely uh, light yellow color um, with a couch and, you know, a beautiful view of, you know, the streets of Eureka, really. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's a corner office. So it is quite lovely. I'll be having office hours there um, from probably about 4.15 to 5.15 on Mondays. I uh, I work until four o'clock. So I'll, as soon as I get there, I'll be there to, to listen to folks. It's always exciting to inherit a new office. Um, at least, you know, that's how it feels in academia when we're constantly mm -hmm. shifting between them. The, the next question then is just about like hierarchy. So uh, very, very basically the mayor and the city council, these folks definitely work together on a pretty frequent basis. How would you describe the shift between your prior position to the new one, just in terms of like what that means you're going to be doing uh, and where you are in um, the the kind of like hierarchy of city government? Well, so as the mayor, you do not vote. So I will be able to break ties that type of situation. Um, you know, as far as that goes, I think, you know, I'll be presiding over meetings. I, I have been mayor pro, pro tem for close to five years now. I so I have been presiding over meetings um, already. Um, I think it's gonna be really important to, again, practice providing a respectful environment for people that come to the meeting. This has been a challenge over the last several years. Um, we've all really been feeling that, but a, a decorum is gonna be a huge piece of what happens in those council meetings. That's my goal. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an understandable one. We wanna to talk to you a little bit more about that um, a little bit later. I'm curious if you could elaborate just a little bit 
about how, um, you know, your office as the mayor then would situate in relation to like county and maybe even state or federal governments? Is that a, a fair question to ask? Like wh what relationships, sure. if any, exist there? Sure. So currently I do have relationships with several of the Board of Supervisors, um, and I'm looking forward to working with Supervisor Arroyo on some of the things that I um, find important. I have worked with State Senator McGuire on issues regarding um, homeless, camp homeless encampments and um, trash and um, environmental degradation, and I look forward to working with him on other things. You know, currently, one of the biggest things I'm working on and will continue to work on is mental health a critical piece of a healthy community. So even as mayor, even without a vote, um, I will have a mayor's initiative and I'm really looking forward to continuing um, building on the city's works so, this far. And and this is work that you've been working on quite a bit. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more in sure. the next <laughs> segment. I'm curious, um, you know, do, do you feel like your relationship with any of those folks changes at all as you step into the mayor's office or is it just kind of more of the same, just kind of collaborating and working with people to get things done? Collaborating and working with people to get things done. Yeah. That's the priority. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Um, okay, so take us through a typical day on the job before you uh, ran for the mayor's office. Like, what time did you get up in the morning? What do you do to prepare <laughs> for work? What sorts of things do you do as the day goes on? Uh, do you take your work home with you at the end of the day? I think we all do that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So um, just to be clear, so as a council member and as mayor, it's not a full-time position. Right. So I work currently at Eureka High School um, in a life skills classroom. I'm an aide in that classroom, and I teach reading, social, emotional, um, and math to kids and, uh, excuse me, to students. Mm -hmm. They're a little mm -hmm. older than kids mm -hmm. these days. Mm -hmm. um, and that language matters, you bet. <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. And I feel really blessed to have that opportunity to be with our youth. I think, you know, being that our youth is our future, it's really important to invest at this age and younger um, to create the future we want. For sure. Yeah. When it comes to being a council member, like, is this something as a part time job, then most of us that have part time jobs, at least my experience with it has been that it is it, it is very much like I'm on the clock and then I'm off the clock. And that's oh, it. no. But I, no. I can't imagine that that's no, your life not at all. Like. So no, 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 it's no. Something not that at you're all. thinking about pretty early. And, and, and do you do that work to kind of fill in the cracks or do you try to no. give yourself a regular <laughs> schedule? What's that like? Um, there is no schedule necessarily, except for council meetings and the um, meetings that I am, attend for uh, different groups, like with the Humboldt Bay Fire. I've been on that GPA board for my entire term. Um, I'm on the Cape Board Community Access Project Eureka. Um, I'm on the uh, the liaison for Sequoia Park Zoo. So I go to all those meetings. One thing I do want to say, though, just to go back for a moment, is that the gift of working with those kids is that, you know, I one of the other things that's really important to me is that all people have value, regardless of where they're at in, in their, um, you know, what spectrum they're on. And so that is another gift of that work. So going back to council, I just wanted to clarify that. So going that. back to council, I work with council. It's part of my life, <laughs> pretty much. I mean, I work on the weekends. I work when people can meet with me. I'm constantly thinking of people that I that need help or that I have helped, or how can we get people connected? Um, how can we make things happen? So there's always um, collaboration happening with people and also just, you know, processing a lot of the information that we deal with all the time. As a member of a city council, it would be very hard to leave work because you live in the place that you are representing. So I would imagine you're constantly on the lookout for things that could benefit from more attention. Do you expect that any of this will change as you become the mayor? Because as you said, it is also a part-time job. Um, mm -hmm. Do you expect it to be just kind of more of the same there in terms of the day-to-day? -day? Sounds like more regular uh, office hours, perhaps? Well, I will have office hours um, because I do have an office now. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the thing that I see changing, um, hmm, I guess probably I'll be doing more ribbon cuttings. <laughs> but do you as get the as... big scissors or do you have to bring your yes. own? I've always no. wondered. <laughs> oh my gosh, those things are incredible. Yeah. So yeah, I will be doing more of that, but I will continue to work um, in the areas that I have been working in the past and um, because they're very important to me. Yeah. And I want to see things shift and change. Yeah. 
I think we all do. Um, yeah. I think everyone has a very general understanding of like what a mayor is, the executive of the city, and you run meetings and things. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think there are any like misconceptions out there that people have about the mayor's office that you would want to speak to? Um, or maybe even just public office in general, your time on the city. Oh, council, yes. Like, public. Yeah. Yes, I suppose, you know, because um, being in public office does not mean that, um, I guess it could mean, but I, you know, if you're in it for the money, then you probably shouldn't be doing it. That's the first thing. And, um, you know, we hear a lot about, about that, you know, the kickbacks and those types of situations. And I can tell you that the best kickbacks that I've ever received this whole time I've been on council is watching people have the opportunity to grow into themselves and to be better people and better citizens, that that's the best kickback to get. Um, as far as, you know, we can't just change things on a dime. We can't just make up our mind and, and, um, and just change it tomorrow that, you know, there's a process that we have to go to. And I think sometimes folks feel like we have a lot more power than we do. Mm -hmm. um, but the truth is, is that there's a very um, robust process to the work that we do. And, um, and that'll continue. And that's, you know, that's really a, a great thing because it gives people in the public an opportunity to participate um, in a way that, you know, I think I think is really helpful. It's very important for everyone to have their voice heard. Folks that were listening to KZZH before our interview were listening to some of the public commentary about the cell towers that they want to build, the 5G light cell towers. And they, they re really spoke to this idea that the public has, an, a, you know, often a misunderstanding about what the city can even do in light of the federal regulations. And yes. Things. And that lack of satisfaction at the public level, the individual said, can be painful. It can be very painful mm -hmm. as a public servant. Um, that made a lot of sense to me. So that's kind of a misconception. What do you wish everybody knew about public office or about the mayor's office? Like, what do you, what are, are there little secrets that the public just isn't aware of or doesn't take the time <laughs> to know about that could maybe plug us in a little bit more? You know, no, um, I wouldn't say that that would be the case. What I would say, though, as a public servant and as your next mayor, I, I hope that people feel like they can be, that they can reach out that we're available, that you can come to public comment, that if you have an issue, you can call on the phone, that you can meet with me in my office. And, and this has been true with other council members, you know, the council members that we have in place now, we're available. And if there's something going on, you know, call us, email us, you know, it's, it's important. A lot of times it seems that folks get on social media and have their, their say without even connecting with us and giving us an opportunity to support them in their idea or to help them figure out ways to make it happen or the reasons why we can't. But um, yeah, I, I would hope that in this next, next season that folks would really realize that we want to hear from you. Yeah. It's no secret city council meetings are kind of magic. Uh, you get policy and public commentary, which I wrote can range from thoughtful to Maybe we can say fringe. Uh, it is <laughs> literally, though, what our community is made of. What do you do to prepare for these meetings? What is it like sitting through so many of them? So I love it. I love it 100%. I love listening to people. Even when people are rude and mean, they still have their voice, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm hopeful that we can tone down on the rude and meanness, so more people feel more confident and comfortable coming to the meeting. Because, yes. you know, I worry about that sometimes, that sometimes people who really want to speak won't come because they don't want to be attacked or called out or, you know, made fun of or, you know, for their opinion. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we certainly will be working on. But, you know, to prepare, there's, um, we do an agenda review. We look through what's going to be on the agenda. We have that a week before, and it gives us the opportunity to ask questions to meet with people that we need to meet with um, and that type of situation. And I just, I love the public process. I love when people can come forward and we can hear and work together to make things happen in grand ways and small ways. Do you have any favorite memories that you'd like to share from any of these meetings in the past or just any moments in particular that really stand out? Oh my gosh. Pre preferably in a good way. <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> So, yeah, there are several. Um, you know, I think 
Well, one of the biggest things that, that council ha has done since I've been on council is the return of Talawat Island. And I'll tell you some of the best moments in the meetings were those moments when the council 5-0, we're gonna continue, we're gonna carry on, we're gonna return the island. Mm -hmm. You know, those moments where we had public comment where people were really interested in the healing of our community. Those types of things were really amazing. And then also, you know, working as I did out in Palco Marsh um, for that year before we vacated it, it was really interesting and it was nice to watch people really start to understand that, you know, addiction, not all people, but many people started to understand that, you know, addiction is not uh, a moral issue and that people that are homeless, you know, they didn't go to kindergarten and say, you know, when I wake up, when I'm, you know, 20, I'm going to be a homeless person and live out in the weeds and trash and do drugs, you know? I mean, I think we brought a lot of attention to those, those issues and we continue to. And um, so those have been some really priceless moments for sure. And, you know, another one just real quick is uh, we, the city partnering with Betty Chin has done a pathways to payday and that gives people opportunity to get work and jobs and that type of thing. And I remember one gal who had gone through the program, uh, her first name was Lucy and she came and she spoke about the program and how it changed her life, you know, and that right there, that's the kickback. That's the gift of being in public service is getting to see people grow and change and be a part of our community. That's, that's one of the biggest things um, that I love. You are listening to KZZH 96.7 FM, streaming on kzzh.accesshumboldt.net. Access Humboldt, local voices through community media. My name is Dr. Aaron Donaldson. It's December 5th, and this is The Civic Union, a collaboration between Access Humboldt and the Department of Communication Studies at Cal Poly Humboldt, uniting the people of Humboldt County with their representative government. We want to hear from you. You can drop us an email to thecivicunion at gmail.com. That's all one word. Uh, you can also find us on Twitter at The Civic Union. Uh, today, we're talking with the mayor-elect for the city of Eureka, Kim Bergell. We're talking about her making the shift from the Ward 5 seat to the mayor's office. Uh, we're about to get some background from the mayor-elect to contextualize her time in public service. And then we'll be looking at some of the issues that we've already talked quite a bit about uh, that will be facing the city of Eureka, California, as she steps into that office. Uh, Mayor-elect Bergell, again, thank you so much for your time. I was wondering if we could just go back a little bit. Could you tell our listeners like where you were born? Do you have a first political memory? It's one of my favorite questions to ask. Sure. So I'm born and raised in Eureka, homegrown, <laughs> I like to say. Mm -hmm. I was born, I, I grew up right near the zoo, actually. Went to oh, Washington cool. Elementary, Winship, Eureka High, um, and I've been here almost my whole life. Of course, I left for a short time, but came home because this is the place that I love and you know I got to raise my kids here and it's just been a real a real gift um, and what was the other question I'm sorry do you have a first political memory I tell people that when I was a kid I saw um, George H.W. Bush take the oath of office on TV mm -hmm. and for some reason that just always stuck with me as being a moment where I'm like government is a thing and it is important and um, I just like asking people if there's a similar moment for them that situates, you know, a representative government, at least in their lives. Sure. So I, I would have to say that this is kind of funny, actually, it's not really a, but my first memories of politics were Jimmy Carter and his brother, the peanut farmer and the beer. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> that's where it just my, sounds quaint in hindsight, doesn't it? <laughs> it truly does. Yeah. Yeah. That, those were my first experiences. Um, and yeah, and it's interesting because I love Jimmy Carter to this day. You know, what a great example of public service and civil service and humanity. You Literally know? building houses, probably as we speak. Um, yeah, in his 90s, Yeah, you know? Yeah. Uh, I want to why... be like that. <laughs> it's, it's an ambitious goal, and I, I appreciate it for sure. Why did you get into local politics? Like what, um, you know, made you decide to run for office or, or get involved? So I um, I have two kids. Um, and they were small at the time. And we would ride our bikes all over Eureka. We'd ride our bikes to school, to the market, to wherever. And transportation safety was 
oh my God, it was awful. Mm -hmm. It was terrifying sometimes. And so um, I got on the Transportation Safety Commission for the city of Eureka and I stayed on that. It was almost eight years um, trying to figure out solutions. So we were part of you know, the, the zoo area um, and some of the changes on F Street. You know, we were involved in a lot of the heads up campaign, uh, making Eureka a bike safe or a bike friendly city. Um, all of those things happened on the Transportation Safety Commission, and that was wonderful. I really enjoyed that. My son would go sit behind me in the dais playing with Legos. It was just a really, it was a really great time, you know. Um, and as my time was coming to my my second term was coming to an end. Uh, someone had reached out to me about running for council because I'm one of those people. I love the council meetings. I would watch them. I watched them for a long time prior to the meetings, and they were just so interesting. And I, we look forward to Tuesday night. In fact, in fact, my kids, I remember there was this time when someone asked them, you know, have you ever had a TV dinner? And they said, yeah, we have dinner uh, in front of the TV every Tuesday. You know, during council meetings, not every Tuesday, but during uh -huh. the council meetings. And the that was so meeting, true. Of course. <laughs> of course. And I remember my very first council meeting I got to go to. Oh my gosh. I was like in awe. It was, I was just so grateful to be there. And it's such a different vibe and different energy to be in there. So, what ended up happening was someone asked me uh, to run. And I said, no, I didn't really think that was something I wanted to do. And then the next council came in. Um, and I got, to be honest, I got a bit of a resentment, um, and, uh, you know, as you know, or you may not know, but the uh, Jefferson project now, the community center is thriving, but what I had watched, which is awesome, things work out the way they're supposed to, but what I had watched was a council prior to the new one who had worked vigilantly to, to get the, the money to support this community center to make it happen. And so first or second meeting coming in the new council, put the kibosh on that. And uh, that was really frustrating. Uh, and, and as I said, it all worked out the best it could. Um, they're, they're thriving at the Je Jefferson Community Center and it's wonderful. Uh, and then the second resentment, and this one, I, I am so, I have so many great feelings about this now, but uh, Mayor Yeager had written an apology letter to the Weot tribe regarding the massacre and, um, and those things. And you know, when he brought it forth to council, it got leaked early at the time standard. And when he brought it forward to council, council was concerned about litigation for the letter. And that was really <laughs> upsetting to me because if you're going to make an amend, that means you're going to change and you, you do it for free and for fun. You don't do it because you're worried about litigation. That was just so unreal to me. So when I was asked again to run, I decided to, I was like over that. Um, and so I did, and I won, and I was so, I'm so thankful for that. I won by 46 votes, I think it was, or, yeah, I was down 101, and I won by 46. So um, that was really, it was a big shock, and yet um, I'm so thankful for that. And that's how it all began for me. It's a fascinating story, and I can absolutely appreciate with the bike transportation safety as a regular cyclist, as a parent, it's so important and you feel so vulnerable out there mm -hmm. without any of that infrastructure. Um, and I, I want to continue to applaud that work, you know, just in terms of what you do to acknowledge and, and own and account for the legacies of settler colonial genocide that are as real here on the coast as everywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, two just incredible reasons to get involved in local politics. I'm wondering if you can give us a little specifics on how you get involved when you say you got onto the transportation safety commission mm -hmm. what is what does that look like how do people do that well so i was blessed i my kids went to a, a preschool with jeff leonard who was on council at the time um his children not with him mm -hmm. uh, and so he had mentioned that that job was going to become available or that there was an opening because I was complaining to him all the time ad nauseum about how fearful I was to ride my kids. Because my kids were three and probably 18 months. I mean, they were little, little, mm -hmm. you know, and I had a trailer and then the tag along and then both. And um, and so he he put out that, that there was an opportunity. And so I grabbed hold of that and um, applied and uh, was accepted. And that's where that began. And as for folks that are interested in getting involved, you know, the city is co consistently looking for people to be on our commissions. 
and all you need to do is apply. And I know that um, when those are coming forward, they're announced in our newsletter. I post them on my Facebook pages, all three of them. Um, we discuss them at council meetings. There's, you know, there are ways, and if you're interested in getting involved, just give me a call and we'll see what's available. I mean, it's that simple. And then you just fill out your application and move forward. It may or may not be open at the time, but can you give us just a quick list of some of the commissions that you you might have in mind or that you're thinking of that maybe oh, come my up goodness. from time to time? Or I'm kind of putting oh, you on the all, spot here. <laughs> yeah, no, they all come up from time to time. They all come yeah. up from time to time. Um, they were just recently looking for people for the Transportation Safety Commission mm -hmm. and I believe the Energy Commission. Mm -hmm. So the rotation is four, two years, four years, four years, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Um. What has been the biggest struggle for you or what has been like the biggest challenge that you've had to overcome as a uh, public servant? Hate, hmm. um, bottom line. And I wouldn't say hate towards me. I would say hate in general. And, hmm. um, you know, when you were talking about those great memories hmm. of being on council, one of those just happened recently. There's been a lot, a lot of hate happening in our region. Um, about the transgender um, and the people that are with pride, uh, a lot of hate and a lot of vitriol. It's just, it's awful. And so I was so pleased and proud of our council and felt privileged. We all dressed up at our last meeting. I don't know if you saw that, but each one of us wore a color of the rainbow. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had a rainbow across the dais saying, you know what, we stand firm with love and not with this kind of vitriol that's been happening. It's it's crazy, you know, and, and I've dealt with that in a lot of people are afraid of what they don't understand. And I, I understand that 100%. But, you know, it's time that we start looking to learn about things that we don't understand instead of um, just shredding them with our words uh, based on little or no information. And that has been probably one of the biggest and most frustrating parts of being on council from whether it was working with the homeless folks in the Palco Marsh, who, by the way, are human beings, mm -hmm. um, whether it's been working with addicts and alcoholics um, that have struggled, which, by the way, are human beings, <laughs> with working with folks with mental illness. You know, I look at um, some of these sites on social media and, and some of the folks, the things that they say and posting videos of people in, in a mental health crisis and thinking that that is funny. Mm -hmm. Those are the kinds of things that I find most problematic. Um, I believe that we can all talk and we can all reason things out. We all agree on something. Uh, and it's be to start there, you know, begin there and build. And uh, unfortunately, there's, you know, some folks that just feel the need to be mean spirited and, uh, and unwilling. And uh, so that's been a huge frustration. And I think we can all, you know, agree. And it's been demonstrated that that behavior has been normalized, that that kind of um, really flamboyant displays of aggression and hate uh, towards vulnerable populations, but also towards members of city government and, and state and federal government. Mm -hmm. um, it's become much more of a show, much more of a display. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I definitely want to pick your brain a little bit about this in, in the coming segment, but sure. I just really want to ask you, you had a very interesting campaign for uh, the mayorship. You ran unopposed. And I'm wondering, how does that compare? You know, tell us, like, is there any story at all to tell besides you ran unopposed for mayor? Or was there in some way a kind of campaign or election process um, that was involved there? What was that like? Well, as you may be aware, I did run for Board of Supervisors. Mm -hmm. um, I ran it with um, my co-counselor, council member, Natalie Arroyo and Mike Newman. And the reason I ran is I really felt like these issues, the mental health, the um, problems that we're, we're having in our city, the fact that the city, you know, takes the brunt of a lot of these issues. Um, and we, you know, have, it's a lot happening in our city, more so than probably any other because we're the county seat. So I did run for supervisor and I did do a heavy campaign of door knocking and all of those things. So to be quite honest with you, I was very grateful <laughs> to run on a post <laughs> and to like not gift, knock right? <laughs> all the doors again, right? right? Um, yeah. But it's, again, I still really, um, you know, one of the things that I try to do on the regular is really meet people where they're at, whether that is, you know, 
at a chamber uh, event or which I'm going to be I'm going to be going to those more often and I'm looking forward to that whether it's in Palco Marsh, whether it's sitting on the side of the road with somebody who's having a really hard time, you know, whether it's a business owner that's frustrated, you know, I get to be, I like to be face to face and to have those conversations in a way that we both, you know, first of all, that they feel heard and potentially we can come up with something that's going to work for them, you know, and that, I love that. Do you have any uh, messages or anything to say to people that might be considering a career in politics or maybe people that never considered a, a career in politics that could be listening? Mm -hmm. What about to people who might just choose to ignore politics altogether? Yeah, well, I, I, I would say, again, you know, your voice is important. Your voice is important. Your voice is important. And, you know, we make change in small ways all the time. And if you're interested, get involved. And there's, there's a lot of ways to get involved and maybe you don't wanna be in city or state government. Maybe you do, but a great starting place to see if you like it at all is to come to council meetings, to voice your opinions, to get involved with the community, to show up at different things, cleanups, um, Arts Alive, Friday night markets, you know, Thursday night dance, you know, concerts um, and everything in between, you know, meet the local business owners, you know, get involved. I this think is our city. This isn't my city or the council city. This is our city, and it's important to pick up an oar sometimes, right? Absolutely. I think people often feel like that work individually maybe doesn't make a difference. But as I was driving down here listening to the public comment of one of the city council meetings, it was just I found myself thinking about all of the different ways that members of the community standing up and voicing their concerns and being, you know, listing their name and where they live. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that works in the community for people to kind of see themselves in that deliberation or to maybe just dis to, to hear that that opinion is out there and to say, I disagree with that opinion. And then it's a question of, you know, how are we going to get involved in our community? A lot of people feel very alienated. A lot of people get very, very apathetic or they mm -hmm. are or just generally overwhelmed. Uh, mm -hmm. any, any thoughts for those folks about how to kind of shake those feelings off and get a little more optimistic with what's possible? Uh, show up, <laughs> show up, show up to some of the events that we have in our city, show up to, you know, like I said, the cleanup, show up to a council meeting, um, meet with the council meeting, meet with the mayor, you know, um, your voice is important. And that's, that's one of the main things I want to get across is sometimes we can't do everything that everybody wants. We just don't have the power to do that, but listening and finding ways to find solutions together and it, and disagreeing respectfully when we can't, there's that word again, huh? respectfully when we can't, moves us way ahead uh, in the game. And this is our community. This isn't, like I said, it's not my community. It's not council's community. We're all in this together and we all need to step up and, you know, at least allow our voice to be heard. Is it getting harder to show up? This is where I want to ask the question. It feels more and more like we're facing a real crisis in terms of public confidence in governing. This mm -hmm. manifests itself in terms of apathy, but also hostility. Mm -hmm. um, have you experienced a meaningful shift uh, since 2014 or so? And now I, I think that that's a very... Uh, that is an especially important time to be in politics, uh, given the election of 2016. Have you experienced, it sounds like you're experiencing a pretty substantial shift in this regard. Yes, yes. So, you know, when I was first on council, we we had many public commenters. We were, again, we were working through the whole um, Palco Marsh issue, you know, with the environmental degradation, the folks living out there, the crime and all of that. And we had count, people come to council meetings, a lot of people come to council meetings and do public comment and disagree. But they disagreed without name calling. They disagreed without um, putting people down to make themselves feel important. I mean, of course you had a few of those, but certainly not like we have now. And it, it wasn't as, you can just feel the mean spiritedness coming out um, now. And what I would say is that with all of that, it's still worth it. It's still worth it to be involved. It's still important to be involved. And the only way we're going to change that vitriol is to work together to make make things and make change happen. 
Yeah, I, I tell my debate students that when especially angry and hateful people show up with things to say, what I tell myself is they can't be the only one speaking. There has mm -hmm. to be some kind of example that is more charitable, hopefully, or more knowledgeable, preferably both. And that's not easy. That, that takes a lot of labor to, to be that person in a room full of that kind of reaction. So sure. just want to acknowledge that work on your behalf and all of our representatives. Um, in May of this year, you, you told the North Coast Journal that two of the biggest problems facing Eureka, you've spoken on each of these tonight, are mm -hmm. the lack of mental health care and the lack of affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Can you give us just some context on why these problems are so persistent in our community in, in your view? Well, you know, I think the the affordable housing is an issue um, that stems from, you know, probably 20 years ago. You know, I mean, we they, it always catches up, right? Mm -hmm. So in the city, we've been working diligently to find ways to being inventive and creative to find new ways for um, affordable housing and for market rate housing, for housing in general, because it's not just affordable housing that we need. It's it's all levels all levels. And just to be clear, affordable housing does not mean um, somebody that may or may not be homeless. You know, it's, I believe it's 30% of your income. So let me get that number right. But regardless, it has to do with people who, you know, are the waiters and waitresses, people like me, you know, mm -hmm. you know, a, a lot of us qualify for affordable housing. It doesn't mean that it's somebody that's, you know, destitute and hasn't lived indoor, indoors for 30 years. Right. So I just want to be clear about that too, because people get that confused, I think. Yes. Um, yeah. So there is that. And then, you know, w with mental health, you know, I, I, it is such an important, important issue and we see it every single day and we have people working on it every single day. And it's, you know, we've got to continue, continue to do better, you know, and I really, believe 100%, the more, the better we do to lift people up, the better our community will be. And I think about some of the times when I've been in certain places in town, you know, and I've seen somebody having a mental health crisis and it can be very scary for mm -hmm. folks, you know? Um, and, the, and the behaviors around, um, you know, ripping plants out, you know, doing the things that folks do when they're having a mental health crisis um, can create a lot of problems for business owners, uh, and for people that live in their homes as well, you know, people that live in neighborhoods. Um, and so finding solutions that are going to get at people one day at a time or one person at a time uh, is going to be critical. And I'm so thankful. This is one of the things I'm thankful for is that the city, you know, has hired Jacob, who will be over. He's a guy that's going to be overseeing um, two mental health clinicians. We've got our CSET team, you know. The city's constantly stepping up to try new things. Now, maybe they won't all work, but the willingness that our city has shown in um, finding new and innovative programs for folks, you know, we've just got to keep working on those things. CSET, you know, the police department, all of those things are really important. As far back as I could find, um, just in the search that I did prepping to talk to you, mental health has been an issue that you've mentioned really frequently. And um, I'm just curious, why is it such an important issue for you? It's an important issue to me because I've known people that have been mentally ill, and I've known people that have been mentally ill that have gone to some provirons and weren't let in for whatever reason. Uh, maybe there were too many people, whatever. Um, and I've had friends suicide like that. <clears throat> And so that's very um, painful. Mm -hmm. um, and then just to see folks suffering, suffering and being marginalized for that suffering, though it isn't a moral issue. I really feel like we all, you know, we all have a place here and um, some of us might need a little bit more help, you know? And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's mental health is a, 100% probably the most important thing that I would like to see change. And it's not that we're not doing anything. That's the thing I want to be clear about. Like, mm -hmm. you know, people say, well, the county has all this money. What are they doing? Well, they're doing some stuff. They're doing some stuff. You know, they're working on a navigation center. They're getting some things done, but it's not enough. And nor is the city of Eureka's work enough. It's got to be a regional thing. We've all got to work together. Can you just spend a quick minute talking about like what's on the horizon? You've mentioned some of the things that we've done just recently that you think can make a difference. 
what's on the horizon that you're maybe excited about or that you want to work towards in terms of making uh, community inroads with regards to the mental health crisis in particular? Well, I feel like one of the things that's really important is uh, education. Education. You know, mm -hmm. COVID really, I believe, has exacerbated the problem with folks. You know, mm -hmm. mental health doesn't discriminate. It doesn't care if you live outside or inside. It doesn't care if you're, you know, making triple digits or if you're, you know, barely making it, you know, mental health, it, it doesn't discriminate. And so that's really something that's important. So, you know, I think that educating folks on that and, and really looking at stigma reduction, because, you know, people don't go get help because they don't want to be looked down on. They don't want to be made fun of, you know, what, for whatever reason, they don't want to be that person. They don't want to be, feel shame like that. And the truth is, is that it's, it's nothing to be ashamed of. I mean, so many people experience problems. And so really educating folks on what that can look like, you know, and, um, and getting people's stories out there. You know, we, we're afraid about what we don't understand. Well, when we hear other people's stories, it helps us to understand. And when you see that person and you see where they've come from and how far they've come, um, you know, it really... I mean, some of these people, it's its really magical to watch their lives just grow and change. It's just beautiful. So um, that's part of it, education um, and working against stigma. And then just continuing to look at what innovative programs can we use to help folks and support folks. And again, you know, I've heard this, uh, you know, well, what, when's my turn? You know, how come I'm not getting any of this, you know, these kick, you know, these kickbacks or this kind of thing. And, you know, I, I, in my mind, I think to myself, you know, well, I'm pretty grateful that I'm not in a position where I need those types of situations. You know what I mean? Like, and it's important to be able to have that kind of compassion to, to lift each other up. I, I think that the kickback to folks like that has to be seen as something that is less about an individual and more about a society. I think you've spoken about this a little bit at the top where, you know, society is better when all people are valued and all people are seen and all people are respected. 100%. And we can't really put, you know, a, a dollar amount on what it means to have people that aren't having panic attacks in our neighborhood, um, you know, let alone dealing with the depths of addiction um, and houselessness and things like this. So yeah, I just really appreciate your your nuance in dealing with that question. Um, and it's a good example of, of a fairly profoundly ignorant approach to some of these issues. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think people really expect you know the the government to give everybody the same amount but when you're facing crises like this that are shouldered so disproportionately by some populations it's you know it, it, it's a little bit uh it, it requires a little bit more nuance so um we are talking with the uh, mayor of uh, elect for the city of eureka uh kim bergell uh, this is the civic union uh, and we do we want to hear from you you can email us at the civic union at gmail.com you can send us a Twitter to at the Civic Union. Uh, we've just been talking to Mayor Elect Bergel about making the shift from Ward 5 to the mayor's office. We've gotten some background, and we're just spending a little bit more time diving into the issues facing the city of Eureka, California. If you've got any comments or questions, that's the Civic Union at gmail.com or at the Civic Union on Twitter. You're listening to KZZH 96.7 FM, streaming on kzzh.accesshumboldt.net. Access Humboldt, that's local voices through community media. My name is Dr. Aaron Donaldson. It is December 5th, and this is the Civic Union, a collaboration between Access Humboldt and the Department of Communication Studies at Cal Poly Humboldt, uniting the people of Humboldt County with their representative government. Uh, we're talking today to the mayor-elect for the city of Eureka, Kim Bergell, uh, Kim, thank you for spending the hour with us talking to you. I really appreciate it. I'm wondering if we could turn now to the conversation about houselessness. You've spoken just a little bit about why this problem is so persistent within our area. How would you describe the like the state of the problem? How big is this problem? What kind of perspective do you have on it just based on your time working in city government? Well, I think that um, honestly, even a small amount of people houseless is you know, is not a good thing. It's, it's, it's something we would still need to work towards. You know, there are arguments about how many homeless people live in our region. Um, 
okay, <laughs> that's fine. But, you know, for me, it's more about the action. It's more about not numbers. I mean, numbers are important, but really getting down to causes and conditions and connecting with people um, on that level of, you know, what can we do to be useful or what can, what do you need? You know, those kinds of situations are going to be the way that we can help people. And I just, um, I'm so proud of the city of Eureka for all of the efforts that they have made, that we have made um, to, you know, hit the rock on this. And when I say hit the rock, I mean, you know, it takes a stone, stone cutter a bunch of times to hit the rock before it breaks. And we never know which one's going to, which one's going to break it, which one's going to move it. Right. Mm -hmm. But we keep hitting it anyway, you know, if, and if you don't hit it, it's not going to break. <laughs> it's not going to change. Right. So, um, yeah, so I'm really proud of, you know, we've got a great uh, team in Uplift Eureka that go out and make connections with folks all the time, you know, and, and yeah, I, I'm just really proud of everybody that works in this area in our, in our city and our county, because people are doing great work. Yeah, that it's was just, something I wanted to ask a little bit about. You say in your press release that you listen and that you're easily accessible. And I'm wondering, mm -hmm. what do you think that that looks like? What, what matters most in providing access to the public to institutions like your office, especially when it comes to houseless populations that you represent? Like, what does that access look like for them? So that access looks like me at the co-op, <laughs> seeing somebody sitting outside, having a conversation that looks like me going, you know, walking on our beautiful waterfront trail, having conversations with people. That looks like people reaching out to me and saying, you know, I've got this friend or I've seen this person and I'm really worried about them. You know, would you be willing to talk to them or what can I do to support and help them? Um, you know, during COVID, I spent a year, well, almost the whole one year, it might not have been that quite that long, but down at Free Meal, uh, St. Vincent de Paul, I got to volunteer there saved my life, saved my life. I mean, what a gift to be able to give back during such a rough time for folks. And, um, you know, I got to meet a lot of people there and get referrals from people there too. You know, people from there, not, not that work there, but people that are actually came to eat there would say, Hey, Kim, you know, this person's having a really hard time, you know, or whatever. And, um, I can, I can either find them or I can reach out to the resources that can find them and find out what's going on and do what we can to support them in that moment. And, you know, I just want to say this because there's this whole business of, well, they won't take the help, you know, hmm. and you're right. You cannot manufacture willingness. That's absolutely true, but you can, we can, I can treat people as human beings and make those connections anyway. So that when those particular folks are ready to have the help, which happens, Maybe not as soon as we'd like it to, but they know that there's a place that they can go. They know that there's someone that they can talk to. There's, they know that there is help available, you know, and I, and I think that that's really important to recognize is that those connections that we make with people that I get made fun of sometimes for um, are important and critical in, in supporting each other. You've spoken about the stigmatization that comes with mental health um, and houselessness, and I think that it, it's a point worth making. Like when it comes to public welfare, it's some, it's hardly the most corrupt stuff we see. It's some of the most underutilized forms of welfare because of the stigmas that are attached to it. And I've seen studies that say that, that speaking openly about what is available uh, and, you know, what people are in fact entitled to as members of the public, this is something they are entitled to if they qualify for it, can really normalize that. We see this in the union when it comes to applying for unemployment and things like that. Um, and I just think it's really important that 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 work is acknowledged because it does. I think I think it makes a big difference in just kind of normalizing that. Um, and you're, you're talking a lot about seeing people kind of on their level and giving people space and listening to them. I'm wondering, you know, as a listener, what does it mean to you to be a good listener? What makes the difference? Well, it's not my job to tell people how they should live or to judge people for how they should how they live or any of those things. Um, my practice is that to be kind and to see people, really see them and, and, and really let them know that they have value, not because of words I say, but because of actions I take. And, um, and I try that to do that with everybody. I mean, it's not just houseless people. I try to really um, be present with people 
I think it's really important. Um, but you know, it's not my job. I can't make anybody do anything. Although sometimes, frankly, I would really love to be able to, you know, it would be so less heartbreaking to be able to make them do it. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, it's pretty simple, really, you know, I'm not the boss of them. And, um, it's pretty arrogant of me to, uh, judge them because of the, the way that they live. And, uh, that was pointed out to me probably 20 years ago, uh, you know, how arrogant that can be. And, and that's really stuck with me. Can I ask how? Yeah. You know, because I, I was, I was walking with a friend, we were down at the boardwalk and, um, and there were people down there and this is long before counsel and kids and all of that stuff. And I was saying, gosh, you know, I just feel so bad for these people that are out here. It's so cold and oh my gosh, it's so terrible. And they're probably starving. You know, I was just going on and on. And she said, you know, Kim, that is so arrogant of you. You don't know their story. You don't know where they came from. You don't know if they're even unhappy and you think that your life is so much better than theirs. Really? You know, and she again mentioned to me this thing about, you know, friendship and camaraderie and those kinds of things and closeness. And, you know, some of the people on the streets have stronger communities than many of the people that I know that aren't on the street. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, so I really try not to be, not to judge people for the way that they choose to live even when it's heartbreaking. And I will tell the truth. I will say this is heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. I wish you'd go to treatment, you know, those kinds of things, but it it's can be not very subtle, that kind of judgment. And I think that it is often mm -hmm. very well-intentioned when we feel sympathy. Oh, hundred percent. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. People don't say it usually. Way. Yeah. They don't, people don't say things like that because they want to be mean generally. It's just no. that. And we want no. people to sympathize. That is definitely mm -hmm. something that we want. Um, yeah. And there's that powerlessness too, that you feel when, you see somebody and there's like nothing you can do, right. <laughs> you know, nothing. Right. So, well, there's always something that you can do. You can take a crack at that rock there. Um, we yeah. have about five minutes left. Sure. Uh, you've also fought for healthcare workers and nurses. Mm -hmm. As of November 17th, we narrowly avoided what would have been, I'm pretty sure, uh, the largest private sector nurse strike in U.S. history as mm -hmm. California Nurse Association, National Nurses United came to an agreement with Kaiser to raise pay, improve benefits, and worker conditions. Um, walk us through what you know about this particular problem and what do you think the city of Eureka could do to help? Well, that is the struggle, isn't it? So, yeah. you know, because they're separate entities and that can be very frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I've talked to many nurses on an individual level and I've heard the conditions that they work in. And I tell you, it's abhorrent. And it's not abhorrent because it's dirty or anything like that. It's abhorrent because we don't have solutions or places where people to go. You know, at the ER is the only place that they can take people that can't kick them out, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. I mean, they, unless they're like totally violent. But um, so looking for ways to bridge that for folks, um, you know, our healthcare workers have, are on the front lines of everything that happens in our city and in our region and in our in our nation, you know, they're there, they're experiencing all of it, you know, and I can't even imagine sometimes some of the trauma that go, that comes with that and the things that they see and, you know, being hit, you know, you're a nurse and you're being hit by somebody who's, you know, coming out of some kind of something, you know, I mean, it's just, it's unacceptable. And so those are the things that I, that I know, um, and what I would really love to see, actually, I, thank you for asking me this question, because I've brought it forward um, to the former uh, ED at St. Joe's, the Provident, but, you know, is having a chill space for people. In other words, if you have a mental health, you're having a mental health crisis, you know, have a space for those folks to be with clinicians where they're not out with, the, you know, with grandma and grandpa out there suffering from you know, whatever they're suffering from or little babies with the flu or something like that, give them a space where they can actually, you know, process what they're doing, where you're not putting other people at risk. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's a part of the hospital that I've learned about that may be a potential spot. But again, this is not something that um, is a city problem. You know what I'm saying? Not, mm -hmm. I don't want to say it's not a city problem because it absolutely is 100% mm -hmm. a city problem. But we really don't have um, 
you can't make an ordinance about it. That's no, not how that's going to work. We don't have the say in it. No, we're, and that that's a real bummer. So yes, I do stand with our nurses 100%. I stand with fair treatment for them. For, um, you know, I remember it's been a couple of years ago, there was a nurse who couldn't even get a break and peed her pants hmm. because she couldn't get a break because she was working on he um, heart monitors. Wow. You know, I mean, we we have to do better for our people, all of us, you know, and, um, and it's a process. It's not an overnight matter. I understand that completely. But again, it's moving in that direction, moving in that direction. And so, yeah. I, my sister is a, a nurse in the city of Calgary, obviously very, very far away. And she talked about how she was, you know, prepared for the feces and for the vomit and for a lot of that. But, you know, seeing someone her age crash and, and just literally die on a table in front of her hit her in a way that she was not prepared for. And there's really nowhere that you can go to work and expect to see something like that spontaneously uh, or let alone on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And I think a, a space like that would be very meaningful in those circumstances. I could see how that would make a huge difference. Um, and I would just really emphasize that, you know, that as a, a city employee, speaking to it's important and showing up to those rallies is important and showing solidarity really, really matters. Um, and I, I would imagine that that's work you want to continue to do as you go forward as the mayor. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. Every mayor I've ever seen on TV has a top hat and a sash. Are these things that you're given when you are elected or do you have to bring your own? No, but my son has a top hat I can borrow anytime I want. There'll okay. be no sash. There'll be no sash. Excellent. Would you like um, uh, real briefly to just share with our listeners a way that they can contact you if they want to get in touch with you or speak to the city council? Do you have any of that available to shout sure. out to the airwaves? Sure. So you can reach me at... 707-616-2178. That's 707-616-2178. Um, that's a great way to reach me. You can text me because I do work during the daytime. You can e email me. My, e my city email will be changing. Um, so that'll be news at 11. We'll have to get that to you. Uh, also, you can contact me on my Facebook pages. I have one for uh, Kim Burgell, Eureka City Council Ward 5, which will be going away soon. Um, and then I have Kim Burgell for uh, Eureka Mayor. So you can contact me there as well. Um, please do. Please do. And, you know, come to our meetings. Come to our meetings and introduce yourself. It would be great to meet you and to hear what you have to say, because that's that's how we grow and change is by listening to each other. Mayor-elect Burkell, thank you so much for joining us and good luck in your future role as mayor of the city of Eureka. Thank you. Uh, this has been the Civic Union and we will be back January 2nd of 2023 to talk to the new Eureka City Council member for Ward 5, Renee contreras Deloach. Uh, I want to thank again our guest, Mayor-elect Kim Burkell, as well as Nate Dogg, the co-creator, producer, and engineer of this show. So far, he has also booked all of our guests uh, we will be interviewing more local government workers. Do you know any? Do you have any issues that we can talk about? Why not send us an email to thecivicunion at gmail.com. That's thecivicunion at gmail.com. You can also tweet at the Civic Union on Twitter. Coming up next is one of my favorite shows, seriously, Living With Your Dog with Charlotte Peltz. I am Dr. Aaron Donaldson. Thank you so much for listening. And stay tuned to KZZH 96.7 local voices through community media.